we really need to think of telogen effluvium on a wide spectrum. Its causes range, as does its severity. The causes are often linked to the following. This is Rob from Perfect Hair Health, and in this video, we're gonna be diving into one of the world's most common hair loss disorders, telogen effluvium. Its definition, its prevalence, its list of causes, how to identify telogen effluvium in ourselves, and what we can do about it. We'll also talk about how telogen effluvium sheds can accelerate things like androgenic alopecia, how nutritional companies manipulate the definition of telogen effluvium to cheat their clinical trials, and importantly, why we should actually care about this because I can tell you that almost everyone watching this video has undergone a telogen effluvium shed even without realizing it. The goal here is to help you better understand the possible contributors to your hair loss so that you can make more robust and more informed treatment decisions. On that note, if you're struggling with hair loss and you're feeling overwhelmed by the information online or maybe you're looking for personal support, feel free to click the link below and sign up for our free email course. It's everything that I wish I'd known back when I first started losing my hair in 2007. So what is telogen effluvium? Telogen effluvium is a type of hair loss that involves excessive hair shedding. Despite its lacking attention online, telogen effluvium is actually regarded as the most common hair loss disorder. And before we can really understand what telogen effluvium is, we have to first understand the hair cycle itself. Each of our hairs undergoes a constant state of growth, rest, and then shedding. This is known as the hair cycle, and typically each of our hairs will grow for between two to seven years, then rest, and then shed, at which point the old hair follicle degenerates, a new follicle comes in to take its place, and the cycle repeats over and over and over again. This is the hair cycle, and at any given time, typically 85% of our hairs are in this growing stage, and then 10 to 15% are in this shedding stage. This is why it's normal for us to shed between 100 to 150 hairs daily, even in the absence of a hair loss problem. Now, our hair cycle is mostly determined by our genetics, but it's also influenced by a set of proteins and hormones. And the balance of these proteins and hormones, they're very delicate. They're sensitive to many things. So if some sort of negative event occurs, this can disrupt these proteins and hormones and trigger excessive hair shedding. In some cases, many of our hairs shed ahead of schedule, leaving us with a time gap between when those hairs fall out and then when the new hairs are supposed to come in to replace them. Now, if the number of shedding hairs on our scalps, those telogen hairs, increases beyond 20%, this shedding is considered excessive, and we're now experiencing what's known as telogen effluvium. This often presents as an even decrease in hair density across the entire scalp, the tops, the sides, everywhere. But some women can also report the shed more locally, like in the temples. The good news is that in most cases, telogen effluvium is 100 percent temporary. That means that once we identify its triggers and then resolve them, our hair cycle normalizes, the hair grows back, and we typically see a full hair recovery after about three to eight months. So what are the causes? Well, there are dozens. And to make matters more complex, telogen effluvium actually occurs on a wide spectrum. For example, most of us experience a small bout of telogen effluvium at the end of each summer. This is called seasonal telogen effluvium, also known as seasonal hair shedding. It occurs because of shifts in our circadian rhythm and our reduced exposure to UVB radiation from the sun, which, for people in the northern hemisphere, triggers a small bout of telogen effluvium every July and August. This pushes our telogen hair percentage just over that 20% threshold. These sheds are often noticeable to us personally, but in reality, they rarely lead to cosmetic decreases in hair density, which means we won't seek medical attention for them. So they're technically defined as subclinical. Another example, vitamin D deficiencies. At the extremes, people with terrible, prolonged vitamin D deficiencies can experience telogen effluvium sheds of 50% or greater. At the same time, literature reviews have shown that minor vitamin D deficiencies only confer slight upticks to hair shedding that may qualify as telogen effluvium, but are less cosmetically perceptible and again, unnoticed and thereby subclinical. 
Then there are traumatic life events and severe health ailments that can trigger major bouts of shedding, where we can lose 50%, 60%, 70% of our hair volume. These are absolutely noticeable, and they do often prompt us to get medical attention, which makes these cases clinically diagnosable. Because of this, we really need to think of telogen effluvium on a wide spectrum. Its causes range, as does its severity, but for acute cases of cosmetic telogen effluvium, the causes are often linked to the following high fevers and severe infections, things like a terrible flu or coronavirus infection, crash diets, a prolonged calorie deficit or rapid weight loss, psychological stress, things like anxiety, or even physical stress like sleep deprivation and childbirth, medications, things like oral synthetic retinoids, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, birth control pills, some antidepressants, and even non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen. And for cases where shedding is more chronic and more persistent, this is often linked to the following. Things like nutrient deficiencies, iron, zinc, vitamin D, B vitamin complexes, nutrient surpluses, excess amounts of things like selenium or vitamin A, or even chronic conditions, things like hypothyroidism, gut dysbiosis, or even certain heavy metal and trace element toxicities. And now that we've covered the causes and the spectrums, we're in a better position to talk about how nutritional companies use misunderstandings about the definition of telogen effluvium to their advantage, so that they can bias their results from their clinical trials to convince people their hair loss supplements will help regrow hair. First, it's worth mentioning that the definition of telogen effluvium has essentially remained the same since the 1990s. A pathological increased number of telogen hairs of around 20% or greater in the scalp. This was discussed in a 2016 editorial on telogen effluvium written by Ralph Trueb, one of the world's top hair loss researchers. Some loud personalities on the internet claim that Trueb's paper proposes a new definition of telogen effluvium, but if we do the hard work of actually reading the paper, we realize that Ralph Trueb is really just defending the long-standing definition of telogen effluvium dating all the way back to Heddington's research in the 1990s, as well as the classification system of telogen effluvium's subtypes, which group together the causes based on how the hair loss occurs. Things like accelerated antigen cycling, delayed telogen shedding, shedding from hair loss treatments like minoxidil, or even shedding from the early stages of androgenic alopecia itself. For these reasons, it's widely recognized that telogen effluvium is probably the most common hair loss disorder. But because most cases are subclinical, doctors tend to only see patients with telogen effluvium in its most extreme states, when the shedding rates reach cosmetic levels. 40%, 50%, 60%, sometimes even higher. This is why there's such a disparity between prevalence rates of telogen effluvium versus diagnostic rates of telogen effluvium. People only seek medical advice when the sheds are so severe that you can literally start seeing through your hair to your scalp. Unfortunately, this disconnect gets exploited in clinical research, especially by companies who want to show that their nutritional supplement is effective at regrowing hair. Here's how this happens. When a nutritional company is designing a clinical trial, the researchers often deliberately exclude patients with telogen effluvium using the narrowed, incorrect, incomplete definition of telogen effluvium that only captures this hair loss disorder at its most severe stages. Massive shedding due to severe stress, severe trauma, or even severe states of things like iron deficiencies or hypothyroidism. Simultaneously, they'll choose to include participants in their study who actually do have telogen effluvium, albeit in less severe forms, and from causes linked to things like chronic stress, dietary problems, and even nutritional imbalances, because they know that taking a multivitamin will often help to correct for these imbalances and, in many cases, improve hair counts. And that will give them a positive trial outcome. And that's exactly what we see in the research. These companies get to claim that their product is clinically effective at regrowing hair. Then they advertise that study to people dealing with androgenic alopecia, who often lack the education to understand that these results don't necessarily apply to them because their hair loss causes are androgenic and genetic in nature. That's why so many people fighting androgenic alopecia end up buying products because of studies showing that things like vitamin B12 or vitamin C or vitamin D or omega fatty acids or even nutraceuticals regrow hair. In fact, 
That's not the only way to cheat a clinical trial by manipulating the definition of telogen effluvium or using telogen effluvium to your advantage. You can also do this with seasonal telogen effluvium by selecting trial start dates that head into telogen effluvium based seasonal sheds. For example, Say you want to sell low-level laser therapy devices, which are really popular for hair loss. Well, how do these devices work? They happen to emit infrared and near-infrared light and within the same wavelengths emitted by the sun. For unknown reasons, this tends to elongate hair growth cycles and improve hair counts. Some researchers, like me, believe that this mainly just prolongs delayed telogen releases from seasonality. So if I'm designing a clinical trial for a laser device, and I want to produce positive results. How would I go about doing this? I would set up a clinical trial in the Northern Hemisphere, and then I would set the start date of my clinical trial to May, and the end date of that clinical trial to November. Why would I do this? Because as my participants enter into the end of summer, I know that reduced sun exposure and changes to their circadian rhythm will trigger a small telogen effluvium based shed in July and August. But I also know that my laser device emits light wavelengths that overlap with the sun and that mechanistically there is a possibility that my laser device wavelengths will protect against the delayed telogen release that is expected in these months. Whereas the people receiving the placebo device they won't have that protection because they're not getting those wavelengths and they'll go through the typical seasonality based shed that we can expect. Then I know that if I end my trial in November, hair counts in the laser group will likely remain preserved while hair counts in the placebo group won't have bounced back yet. I can then use this difference to say that my laser device works and I've even proved it in a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial. And then I get to charge people $3,000 for it. As a medical editor who has worked personally on study designs, I can tell you that this is exactly how marketers manipulate clinical results and how that data can convince us to buy products that we probably don't need. And when you dig into the clinical trial database on low-level laser devices for hair growth, I can't tell you how many actually follow the exact exact trial start date and end date parameters that I just outlined. So it pays dividends to be aware of this stuff because you can make yourself more informed and thereby make better treatment decisions and hopefully save yourself a lot of time and money while you're trying to navigate hair loss. It goes without saying that when it comes to diagnosing our hair loss, a qualified dermatologist or a hair loss specialist is really the best resource. Having said that, not everybody has access to one. And even if you do, many people who go to these people tend to feel dissatisfied with the quality of care. So what are some steps that we can do at home to see if we might be facing telogen effluvium? Well, one thing that we should do is evaluate our hair loss presentation. So consider asking yourself the following questions. Am I shedding more hair than normal? Are these hairs shedding from all over my scalp? If yes, this increases the likelihood of telogen effluvium, especially if you suspect those underlying health ailments. Next, look at the hairs that you shed on your desk, on your pillow, in the shower. Are the diameter of these hairs all the same? In other words, do these hairs all appear to be roughly the same thickness? If yes, and if you're shedding more than usual, that's another indication of a telogen effluvium based shed. If you want to take this even further, you can do something known as a sink wash test. Studies show that these at-home wash tests can accurately discern hair loss types to a high degree. They're a bit cumbersome to do, but here's how to get one done. First, abstain from washing your hair for five days. Second, place a piece of gauze over the drain in your bathtub or your sink. Third, wash your hair. Then count and measure the length of hairs caught in the shower or the sink. According to the authors of this study, shedding over 100 hairs in a given day might be indicative of telogen effluvium. Shedding over 100 hairs with more than 10% of those hairs being three centimeters or shorter in length might be indicative of both androgenic alopecia and telogen effluvium, or even chronic telogen effluvium. Differentiating these is a bit more complicated and we'll have directions on that in future videos. Long story short, if you're shedding a lot of hairs and these hairs all appear to be the same diameter or thickness, this tends to suggest that you're facing telogen effluvium based shedding. And if you're shedding a lot of hairs and the diameters are diverse, meaning some look thick and some look thin, this might mean that you have telogen effluvium and androgenic alopecia, or perhaps even androgenic alopecia by itself. On that note, it's critical to understand that bouts of telogen effluvium, they can accelerate the onset 
of male and female pattern hair loss. This is because the defining characteristic of androgenic alopecia is hair follicle miniaturization. In other words, each hair gets thinner and thinner and thinner over time until you can't even really see it at all. But this miniaturization process, it really only occurs through hair shedding. So with more opportunities for shedding, like those created from telogen effluvium, you have more opportunities for miniaturization. This phenomenon is called telogen effluvium unmasking androgenic alopecia. I'm not kidding when I say that dozens of research groups have written about this. And relatedly, Rodney Sinclair, one of the world's most prolific hair loss researchers, has even described how androgenic alopecia can go through periods of six months of acceleration, followed by periods of six to 18 months of quiescence. No surprise here, those time windows correspond very closely to the timelines expected for seasonal-based sheds. So while these hair loss disorders are separate phenomenon, they do very likely intersect with one another. That's why it's so important to do health evaluations alongside any hair loss diagnosis, especially if you're not responding well to conventional treatments for things like androgenic alopecia. Treating telogen effluvium is really a two-step process. First, you have to identify your individual triggers of excess shedding, and second, you have to systematically tackle them. One way to do this is to compare your health symptoms against the symptoms linked to chronic conditions that tend to underlie telogen effluvium-based sheds. For instance, if you're shedding hair and you're also feeling exhausted, cold, and forgetful all the time, these symptoms tend to underlie iron deficiencies or even hypothyroidism. And so it can pay dividends to seek medical advice for testing for these. If you tend to shed more during periods of high stress at work, well, that's a good indication that work-related stress might be driving small bouts of telogen effluvium and that you'll want to find ways to manage that. Obviously, going one by one through each of your symptoms and their potential relationship to dozens of health ailments, it's an exhaustive process. That's why to simplify this effort, we've actually developed a tool inside of our membership community that allows you to easily catalog your symptoms and then get automatically filtered to those symptoms associated disease states that might underlie telogen effluvium. And that includes recommendations for treatment, lab tests, you name it. But you don't have to use this tool to get started on this process. You can use the video here and also this list of conditions and symptoms to just do a quick analysis and see where you net. Finally, some doctors will also recommend pharmacological interventions for telogen effluvium, certain anti-inflammatories, drugs like minoxidil, in hopes of expediting the recovery of this hair shedding disorder. Incorporating these options are appropriate in some subsets of telogen effluvium, but not all of them. So keep this in mind, and as always, check with your doctor before you do anything at all. Lastly, one of the best things that we have in our defense against telogen effluvium is simply time. We wanna make sure that we're giving ourselves enough time to recover, especially from transient cases of telogen effluvium that aren't caused by nutrient deficiencies. I'm talking more about those cases that are caused from temporary but severe forms of stress, the death of a loved one, trauma due to surgeries, those types of scenarios. As we recover from these events and our stress hormones change, our hair cycle will normalize within three to eight months on average, and hair counts will really improve and return back to full volume typically within a year. So give yourself that time, try to support yourself in the healing process with good dietary, environmental, and lifestyle choices, and just know that you're making the right steps by giving yourself enough time and patience to see recovery. I hope this video helps and I'm looking forward to your progress in the coming months. Thank you.